Uh, thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Howard. It's good to be with you. It's my joy, good brother. Always good to see you, man. And, and great to connect with the wonderful orange of Syracuse. <laughs> it's good to see you. Uh, I've heard uh, you speak several times, and I always think about the way in which you challenge students to discern what they are supposed to do and to discern what the world is calling them to do rather than just doing what people expect them to do. So what I'm wondering is, is that when you realize your calling to ordained ministry, teaching, preaching, higher education, um, when did you realize that that for you was what you were supposed to do? I appreciate the question, man. And I appreciate the opportunity to reflect on, on our journeys. You know, I, I, I wish I could say I always knew. I, I, I know people who were like boy preachers or kid preachers and, and felt like they always knew they were called to, 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 to preach and always called to ministry. And I, I've known people who knew from a young age they were called to be vets or doctors. They always were like caregivers. I, I thought I was going to, you know, play college basketball and be a pro athlete and then if not that, I think I thought I was going to be like a superhero. I think I thought I had these like latent mutant powers that would emerge and I'd go off to some, you know, mutant academy or Hogwarts or something like that. And I, I was a big imagination kid. Um, and then after that in high school, I think I just like was taking it one day at a time. And even into college, I'm not sure I knew what I was being called to do beyond that weekend um, until the bottom kind of fell out for me. You know, I... I had a really rough summer before senior year where like everything caught up with me. And, you know, I, I had lost both my parents by that time and was kind of in the midst of some real uh, alcohol addiction. And that sort of made me sort of blow off college classes. And so I got kicked out of college going into the summer after my junior year, had an internship that didn't go well. And then like, to throw salt on the wound, the person I was dating dumped me like all in like a couple months. And it was just sort of a terrible, uh, you know, it was, it was 2020 for me back in, in the nineties. <laughs> so, and, and I think for the first time I sort of looked upward and asked like, what do you want me to do? Just, I'm, I'm lost. And you gotta be careful what questions you ask. And, you know, you, when, when you're, I mean, they're all kind of religious cliches when, when, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, when you're ready, the path will appear. And like, they're true. I think I was ready to kind of open my eyes and it became very clear to me that the next step was seminary um, and ministry. Um, I sort of was having dreams about it. It was coming up in conversations. I was sort of glowing on pages of books I was reading. Um, and share that with mentors was reflected back to me and people who I trusted and loved. But to be clear, it was just the next step was revealed to me, not like what was around the corner of seminary. I don't think I had any idea what ministry would look like. Um, I don't think I knew what I wanted to do in ministry. Um, and it's all been revealed kind of like on a need to know basis. Like right when I finished seminary, I knew I needed to go into, I felt called to hospital chaplaincy. Yeah. And after that, it was street ministry and like just the next step. And I, and I, I find comfort in that. It's frustrating. I wish I knew what I was going to be doing when I was 60. But like, I trust that that, you know, that curve will appear on the path when it's time. One of the things I love about what you are up to is your writing. And you have a real diversity of writing styles and what you write about. And of course, one of my favorites is your book. Uh, called Pond, River, Ocean, Rain. And Thanks, you explore different ways to find peace in the midst of the storms of life. Uh, that book was published in 2017, and yet I feel like it was written for 2020. Mm -hmm. um, could you share a little bit more about that book and, and your motivations for writing that book and perhaps how that book is speaking to you now? You know, honestly, I, I didn't begin that book with the intention of publishing it. It, it. It's a combination of journal entries and kind of poems that I was writing to kind of process life. And um, I often encourage people, like, don't throw away your journals and, like, 
they don't pack them away in some basement somewhere. Like return to them one, I think it's a, a cool practice to see where you were mentally a year or five years or 10 years ago. But just sometimes there's stuff in there that you want to, you know, I don't know, translate and polish and share with others. And so really the majority of that book was me processing the storms in my own life and the questions that I had. I've always been drawn to water forms. I was, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland originally. I was born kind of right near the Chesapeake Bay. Literally the hospital I was born at is like on water. And like, I, you know, I love playing near creeks and I, my house now is near the river that runs through Philadelphia. And like, it's just always spoke to me. And I think oftentimes whenever I would go to the beach near, near the Jersey shore here um, or near our river, like I find myself journaling and, and reflecting on it. And in particular, most recently, I've been thinking about this notion of a river. And I write about this a little bit in the book, um, but how rivers are kind of wild. And in contrast with like a swimming pool. And so, you know, like, like, like Syracuse, we have a pool on our campus that back before we were kind of working from home, I used to go to our pool and our gym a couple times a week. And it's nice, it's, pools are safe. Like there's a lifeguard over there. I can like stand in most of the pool. It's, it, it's very chill, the water's chill. So I can kind of like get, get a rhythm and it's, there's chlorine in it. So like no one's getting, there's no like bacteria or anything. It's super clean. Uh, there's like nice light, whatever. It's safe swimming in a, in a pool. A few years back, I, I was invited to participate in a Philadelphia triathlon. And like we sort of bike by our boathouse row, we run around there and then we swim in the river that runs through the middle of the city, which I kind of always wanted to do. Um, and so I remember hitting the water you know, at the beginning of the race, it's freezing. And, I get, and I'm like sort of shivering at my little like triathlon little cap on. And I get in the water and like, I'm kind of drifting to the side over here because <laughs> the current was so strong. And at times I felt myself kind of like being pulled down. And I remember thinking as I'm in the water, I'm like, this is wild. Like, like it's literally out of control. Mm. And there's something very scary about not being in control. I think I, I, I far prefer to swim in a, in, a, in a pool where I can put my feet down, I can get in and out if I want to, I'm not going to drown. I might drown in, in a river mm. and, and I might, the current might pull me down and I don't know what's swimming down there. I can barely see like two feet below the water and there's all kind of like dirt, it's dirty and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's frightening. On the other hand, I think a part of spiritual discipline is understanding that we're not in control and trusting the great current beneath us to kind of get us where we need to go. And it's wild and it's scary, but I think it's good. You know, I, 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 I love reading. Uh, I used to read to my kids when they were little. I got like teenage girls now and like they read to me, but like I used to love reading to my little girls when they were little. And we, one of the things we read was uh, the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. And, and you know the quote I'm going to go to. And, you know, the, the four like, Pevensey kids, I think they, they go to this magical land and they keep hearing about Aslan, Aslan, Aslan's coming, Aslan's coming. It's like the, one of the main sort of messianic characters, messianic figures in, in the book. And then someone mentions, you know, Aslan's not a human, he's a lion. And the kids are like, whoa, that doesn't seem very safe. And one of the sort of people who are talking, one of their interlocutors says, who said anything about Aslan being safe? He's not safe, but he's good. Mm -hmm. I think from a Christian perspective, I think God is like that. From a human perspective, I think life is like that. It's not safe. In fact, it's often not pleasant. But I think the current beneath it all is good. I see. When I think about your writing in terms of you're a wonderful poet, and we're going to get to that later on in our program, and when I think about your teaching and when I think about your preaching, I'm confronted with this paradox where on the one hand, I hear this peacefulness, mindfulness, calm, we're there, right? And then also action, social justice, prophetic it's it's both and it's both and 
how do these two come together in your life? Because it really is both. I, I get at both of those from your writing, from your teaching and preaching. Could you share a little bit more about that? It's a great, great hard question, man. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I think I want to say two answers. One thing I've been thinking a lot about lately uh, in my, uh, my end of year you know, we, we deans end up doing like a lot of little blessings and prayers for ceremonies and graduations, all kinds of stuff. My, my remarks to the graduating class last year, whose graduation was like online, was that humans are complex and we have the capacity to hold multiple emotions, certainly multiple thoughts at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for example, during graduation season back in May and June, there's this sort of deep like grief and frustration and sadness at not being able to be with our friends and not having the senior year that they thought they were gonna have or us not being able to have like the, the summer breaks any of us thought we'd have. And yet like real pride and joy at finishing college and excitement for the next chapter and the, the weight of not being able to hang out like all of us want to this summer, but potentially the silver lining of like, you know, we're all moving at a different, better pace and like, during a school year, I never get to have dinner with my kids because they're after doing sports and all kind of stuff after school. We've had like four months straight of dinner together. That's not to discount the deep grief of, of saying goodbye to 150 plus thousand people in our country and folks in our communities, but humans are complex. I think the same is true with your question in that I think we can sort of try for stillness while also being a part of a movement. I think we can sort of hold on to the steadiness of, you know, of, of a rock, but also sort of trust the kind of, you know, transitional changes that need to happen in, in the world. I also think it's, we're allowed to shift gears. You know, I mean, and this is not a perfect parallel, but I think about like, there's this image of Martin Luther King Jr. that always spoke to me. Um, during one of the campaigns, I think in Birmingham, there's a picture of him kind of playing pool at night. And he's like doing like a trick shot, like the stick behind his back and he's like with his buddies. Um, and like that day was like risking arrest. Not taking a, not, not like sort of being hypocritical, but I think he's complex. He's sort of playing and, and pursuing joy and also sort of like pushing for change and, and convicting a nation. The last little thing I'll say, I think this is one of the messages of our, of our religious traditions. Particularly if you think about the way different expressions of our traditions fit together. You know, I, I think about sort of the um, deep kind of contemplative aspect of Judaism, um, this sort of uh, just beautiful Hasidic kind of powerful spirituality and study. And then the kind of like repair the world efforts of like reconstructionist sisters and brothers who are fully living their faith with full integrity, but in, in a different way. And, and they're, they're not necessarily isolated. There's deep contemplation within there. And there's deep action in some ways we're here. Or, you know, the, like a Thomas Merton or like a Henry Nowen who seemingly seem this kind of monastic or contemplative kind of writers, but on the other hand, have this deep activist streak too. Within Christianity, it's the same faith, you know, Benedictine monks and Reverend William Barber are in the same kind of body. That's true in Islam, I think it's true in Buddhism, I think it's true in Hinduism, that you, you have these complexities within our great world religions. I think at best, we can sort of hold all of that within each individual person to me, and if we can, I think we're closer to a, a more perfect expression of our faith. We're never going to get perfect. Mm. And, and, and when we miss the ball a lot. Mm. But I think it's okay to have different types of expressions of our faith. I'm sorry, you're catching me these long-winded answers, Joe. Oh, no, no. <laughs> the, the longer, the better. The longer, the better. More of you, less of me. Um, Come on, man. For, uh, <laughs> for, you know, uh, I'm not the only person that gets to ask, ask questions. So for those who are tuning in on Facebook, and there's a few that have 
uh, tuned in here on the Zoom webinar platform. If you have some questions, please feel free to, to type them on in and our staff here at Hendricks Chapel will make sure that those questions get to me. So if, again, if you have questions for Dr. Howard, please, uh, please share them. Um, those will get to me and we'll get those to Dr. Howard as best as we can. You know, you're uh, on TV. You're kind of like you're like the Oprah of Syracuse. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's you know the the way I've I've heard people explain this is um, like playing out of position. You know where it, it's the next thing you know we're doing these types of shows, and uh, I'd like to say that um, you know studying the film, right? Watching Oprah, see how she does it, and <laughs> trying to bring breaking down film, right? You're good at it. You're good. At it. <laughs> You're too kind, uh, Chaz. I gotta. I gotta read you this quote from uh, President Gutman at Penn. Yeah. Uh, I love this. She. Uh, this is a direct quote from her. She says, "Chaz has made it his life's mission to bring together diverse groups of people. When some see division, Chaz sees common ground. Where some see despair, he sees hope." Where some see hate, he sees love. Uh, my question for you is, how are you able to see love, hope, and common good when we seem to have so much evidence to the contrary? Mm. You know, those were generous words from my boss. You know, I, uh, I, I, I clearly wouldn't be here without her her faith in, in, in our vision for what we can do on campus and yeah. just a, just a tremendous woman herself. I mean, I think she's a brilliant scholar and leader and um, in so many ways has subtly taught me about leadership. And you know, that, that quote, there's a primary that's listened to, I'm like, I don't know who she's talking about. Like that's just, that's <laughs> but, a, but a part of yeah. leadership, I think is not necessarily seeing people as they are now, but maybe seeing what they could be if this works out. Um, and to your question, I, th I wish we could do a little more of that mm -hmm. rather than kind of good guys, bad guys, right, left, you know, like um, it, it, people who are woke and, and kind of racist over there. Yeah. There is an important role in calling out racism and in, in, in calling, naming evil, evil, I think, evil acts but seeing what people might be. Hmm. And, and particularly those of us who are in kind of education get this, you know, the, the first year student who's just a knucklehead and, and does a knucklehead thing and, and no offense to any students tuning in, but like, you know, research shows us like the, the teenage brain isn't fully formed. And so like our freshmen who are doing freshman hijinks and like trying to jump off of roofs into pools, like for YouTube, like just haven't thought that through like necessarily, or you know, like the like sign stealing from the, the rival frat, like and, and no offense, like I, we were there too. I did, I literally stole signs from rival fraternities. Like did bad stuff, but seeing like that kid is not a bad kid, and they may grow up and be, you know, dean of religious life, dean of Hendricks Chapel, yeah, and. Not just are we, you know, more than the the worst thing we've ever done, but we're in process. Hmm. And I and I hope we can extend that same grace to people on the other side. You know, I, uh, I I'm deeply wounded. I'll speak very frankly. I have relatives who are on the other side of the political spectrum from me, who I deeply love, who I, I grew up with, or have like on my my wife's side of the family. And it's easy for me to kind of write them off as like, oh, you're a decent human, but you support policies I think are racist and bigoted. Therefore, you must be a racist and bigot. Therefore, we're done. I will unfriend you. I will block you. You are not welcome in my house. I don't want you around my kids. There's something reasonable about that. Of, I want to protect my children. On the other hand, I'm sad when I give up on folks because like, a, they may change their mind. B, I may change my mind. C, they're, they're more than the vote they cast. And D, like, you know, folks didn't give up on me. Yeah. I, I, to, if I can add one little last ramble. Uh, yesterday, 
one of my undergraduate mentors passed away. His name is Harold Haskins. And Haskins was working at Penn from like late 60s through the turn of the century. And he stacked you know, 40 plus years there, almost 50 years there. And he was still working there when I came back uh, as chaplain. I remember asking him, like, Hask, you, you got any advice for like a rookie? Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do this whole student affairs thing and like, whatever. And, and he was a huge guy. Hask was six, five, six, seven, something like that. And anytime you shook his hand, he smelled like Old Spice. He was like, old, he, like he shaved every day and was Old Spice. And so you didn't have to like really shower. You just kind of shake Hask's hand. You smell good the rest of the day. And he, and he, um, it was a random tangent. The character, this is uh, invoking a name that's not great, Bill Cosby's Fat Albert show. There's a character on there named like Dumb Harold, and it's based on Harold Haskins, kind of like a long, long limbed person. I'm sorry to invoke Cosby. Um, that was Hask. I remember asking Hask, like, Hask, you got any advice for rookies? Like, Chaz, look, just love them the way that we loved you and your generation. Wow. Without a why. Mm. we loved you without a why not because of your grades not because of the jobs you would take not not because of any little clubs you did in high school like the second you set foot on campus we loved you mm. and we saw what you might be someday i think about Haskell a lot and and I'm, I'm i'm actively grieving his loss he lived a good long life but he changed our campus, but certainly the way that I do campus work. And of course, part of that work, the work that, that you and I share is the work of religious and spiritual life. Yeah, man. And, and on a personal note, for those tuning in, Chaz is um, someone that I've looked to for guidance as, as when I've needed it and someone that I, on a deep personal level, respect and cherish uh, deeply. And, uh, you know, Chaz at Penn, you uh, you lead a really robust chaplaincy. You're one that we all look to for guidance and support. And you have a number of different groups uh, from Baha'i to Buddhists, across the Christian spectrum, Jewish, Jain, Muslim, Sikh. Uh, could you share a little bit more about your thoughts about chaplaincy and religious and spiritual life in higher education during this time and why that work matters? And why does that work matter right now? Mm. I appreciate that. I, I, I say the same thing about you as one of the folks who, who I think is doing are doing what we do right. You know, <laughs> I think you're, you're one of the best there is at what we do. Um, and our national bodies have recognized you for that. And, and I hope y'all at Syracuse know what you got. Damn, oh man. Um, I've got a good team. And I think that's key my you know steve and sana and patty and mary before that like make me look better than i am and so I've, I've got a good squad you know i this has been such an emotionally draining yeah. and frightening um and, and angering um, and, and, and heartbreaking and confusing time with the advent of COVID 19 yeah with the murder of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and with the, the cruelty coming out of the White House and seeing you know citizens tear gassed and beaten and like, you know, continue on down the list. It's just a, a really hard time that we feel in here. And at the end of the day, I think our work is about the inner life. You know, I think, I think much of our work is sort of curating um, safe and robust religious life through programming and um, inviting groups to campus and, and, and um, making sure they have the resources they need and, and like the preached word and like all that kind of stuff. But so much of it is sort of journeying with people, students, faculty, staff, alumni, administrators inside. And I've seen our colleagues around the country do this, you know, uh, in, 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 amazing uh, ad adapting ways you know i mean so like just this program right here the pain that people can't gather in hendrix chapel regularly with grace and ease you and and alex and linda and the team like have made this work online mm -hmm. 
and in some ways connecting with people you couldn't connect with before. You got parents sneaking up on here and alumni and like, it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. People around the country are doing cool stuff like this, you know, where, hey, you know what, let's, let's, take, let's take it on, 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 online and, and, it's fa- and, and making it, you know, just the right length and with high quality production and in ways that I think people will continue even after we're kind of meeting in, in person, I hope. But the other aspect is the stuff you don't see. It's the phone calls with people who are in tears that you have. It's the students who are are nervous that they don't have Wi-Fi at home or, you know, being on campus is home and they don't want to go back to an an, an abusing situation. Or, I mean, I I got a call from someone who who was really concerned that the world was ending. Like, not, not joking, that when news about the pandemic broke, she really thought this was the end of the world we get in those conversations with like the smaller ones of like, dude, I, you know, I, I don't know what I'm going to major in or I broke up with the person I was dating or who you think is going to win the NBA championship. Like we're, we're kind of that ear and that friend to kind of journey with folks literally now more than ever, you know, my, my campus rabbis, the priests on our campus, like they haven't gotten a break. They were busier March, April and May, and they have gone hard through the summer. Part of it's planning. Um, for what's going to be a very different looking fall. But a part of it is, it's like people are feeling it. And in major moments, like after 9-11, or during the major wars in our, in our world, or after the Kennedy assassination, attendance goes up in, in worship services. But the same is happening now. People are tuning in more, but they also want to talk more. So I, I am so grateful for campus ministers and chaplains who are kind of caring for the hearts of, uh, of people. Just a few hours ago, uh, we at Hendricks Chapel gave a presentation for some of our first year students who are already on campus and who are quarantined for two weeks, um, as is the regulations. And it was such an inspiring time. And I know a couple of them um, are tuning in right now, and I wish them a good evening and hope they're doing okay. And it was a reminder of the fullness of education and what chaplains, deans of religious life, deans of chapels, I think about our colleagues around the country who are recognizing that that education is more than just information acquisition, right? The the formation of the heart, the transformation of community, the preparation for vocational discernment. And it was- Preach, Dean. It was this, uh, this remarkable reminder that learning is a spiritual journey. And for our particular first year students, uh, for many of them, that journey will be from quarantine to commencement. And in between those two, that reminder of how it is that we are providing people with a trajectory towards an extraordinary life. And I think Chaz, your work, the writing, teaching, preaching, that that, well, those are matters that matter to use the title of this program. and. And for you, that work has now expanded, you know, during this really important time. And I, if you don't mind, I'd love to talk about this. You are uh, the very first person at Penn to hold the position of Vice President for Social Equity and Community. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about uh, what led to that, your acceptance of that, and your hopes and dreams for that, and how you hope to form that position and perhaps how you expect that position to form you. Mm. You know, I hesitate because this is my fourth day in the, on the job in a sense. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of it's just kind of building a new office and, and feeling the, the gift and the weight of two jobs, kind of the chaplaincy and this, this new um, challenge. I mean, I think when when, our, when Dr. Gutman first, when my president first called me, uh, there was a cynical response within around, like, this is something that institutions do. When we're in sort of hard moments, they make like a minority hire and, and feel like we did it. Like we're, yay, we're clear, we're not racist. Um, and, and I rolled my eyes at other schools and businesses that have done that. And I felt that this time I was like, ah, I'm not really trying to be that guy. Like, I want to be the, the not token, because there's other black administrators 
Um, but I was like, I don't really want to do that. On the other hand, like, you know, sitting down and talking with her, she was like, no, we're like, we mean business. And I think a part of the charge is one to like, tell the story of, of what's happening on campus and what needs to happen on campus and, and around campus. But the other thing is sort of elevating the equity and justice issues of the time to the highest level of a university. And so um, this is not just for like the cultural centers, the black cultural center to figure out. It's not just for like our community service hub to figure out that justice and equity and community issues are, are, the, are the business of the whole school, particularly around the kind of like big questions. And so, you know, like, like every school we're wrestling with, what should our relationship be with the police? Students shouldn't just have to wrestle with that. Our trustees and our administrators should. What should our investments look like ethically? You know, like what's our relationship with our local school district? You know, we're, it was probably the biggest um, debate on campus right now. We're technically a nonprofit, so we don't have to pay taxes, but we're the biggest institution in the poorest major city in America. Um, what's our responsibility? Faculty representation, student representation. And not that these questions weren't being debated hotly on campus from, from leaders here too, but I think to sort of turn up the heat a little bit on them and really make some decisions. You know, we, we have an active committee right now and it, it seems minor, but it's big around like the statues and paintings on campus. And every city is wrestling with statues of Christopher Columbus or um, Confederate statues in, in sort of Southern cities, like every, and, and the names on buildings and the legacy of slavery and like, everybody's, everybody's got a past, everybody got a history and, and we need to sort of recommit it today. And so I think that's part of the big charge um, of, of this new role. And I'm excited and I'm nervous about it. Um, but uh, any chance to get back to uh, a school that's given me a lot, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have. Well, I'm glad it's you. I'm glad it's you. <laughs> that's one of us. That's good. So that's good. <laughs> you know, I wanted to go back to this, this moment that we find ourselves in. I, I mentioned this presentation a couple hours ago that's still just in my mind a lot with our quarantine students. I especially wanted to give a shout out to Tori and Isabella who are uh, tuning in here. We're just wonderful, brave new students here at Syracuse University. And one of the things that we one of the things we spoke about together were the consequences of crisis. And we talked about how crisis can give birth to coalitions, how it can give birth to creativity, how it can give birth to clarity. And Chaz, I've heard you talk and write about, you know, what's uh, this moment of COVID and about the own clarity that you've been receiving around going deeper, around deeper and around your, your prayer life, um, deeper, in a sense of meditation. And I'm, I'm wondering over these last months of COVID crisis, if you will, is there anything new that's become more clear to you through this time of going deeper in your prayer life, meditation life, pausing, solitude? I think one thing was that I, I am aware of how fast I was running before. It, particularly for someone who tries to encourage people to slow down. I think I was aware of the, like, I, I was kind of moving at a pretty fast and unsustainable pace. You know, I think silence and quiet can make one far more aware of their own struggles and challenges, you know. Um, I've also connected to that, sort of found a deep gratitude, you know, and and a desire to stay in that grateful place a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I think an even greater awareness of our interconnectedness. You know, and, I, and I think there's a sort of interesting tension in the world where there's this, this intense uptick in kind of nationalism, particularly like a right wing kind of nationalism, uh, most expressed here in England and Brazil and Russia and other places like that. Um, where people kind of want to sort of lock the doors and just take care of us and kick out people who are a bit different. 
On the other hand, we really see how interconnected we are right now. Yeah. You know, not just sort of information wise and business wise, but you know, we, we all are feeling this. Every single country, some far worse, um, but we're all feeling this and we all kind of need each other to get through this. And I think other partner countries have done a better job of helping each other out. Um, I think it was a show that kind of isolationist thing just is not a good move. Um, so I think I've been aware and, 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 and like on a micro level, I think I feel that in my neighborhood Yeah. of like, you know, we, we you extend the kind of quarantine to one's block in a sense. Mm. And there, there's some old folks on our block who haven't been able to make it to the grocery store. And I, seeing my girls knock on the door and offer to like pick up something for them is is cool yeah or like take out their trash or cut their grass and like mm. there's something beautiful about that um, so I, I i think I've, I've i've been picking those things up um, i think one of the one of the conversations that i find fascinating right now is this this conversation around freedom right and for some we're hearing that freedom is me doing whatever I want to do to anybody, no matter what, right? But in your writing, you talk about freedom in a much deeper way. And I wanna read a quote back to you. This is from your book, A Black Theology is Mass Movement. Hey. And this is your quote. It says, if there's one prayer that I offer on your behalf, one blessing that I might bestow upon you, it is the blessing of freedom. That in the end is the goal of black liberation theology, at least as I see it, to glorify God by working for freedom. Thus, I pray that you might be free. Dr. Howard, what does freedom actually look like to you? Mm. Appreciate the, the plugs for the books, homie. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> take, take care of the people who take care of you, right? Yeah. It's, it's, we'll, we'll put some links up for our Facebook followers. Support the Howard family. Generous. You're generous. Um, <laughs> you know, the Shirley Chisholm quote, uh, I think Shirley Chisholm, first Black woman to run for president. This is congressperson. She talked about being unbossed and unbought. And I think the, the older I get and the kind of deeper I get in my career, the harder that is. Mm -hmm. And so I think in, in that book, I write about the um, tension of not just black theologians, but like black professors who I'll speak very personally, I think sort of emerge from kind of black leftist tradition, uh, you know, democratic socialists, um, Black Lives Matter, and yet, in the academy in a place that like pays us great gives us great benefits and and and, and pays us relatively well and we're a part of this capitalist system and then you end up sort of becoming like department chair and then like on the faculty and suddenly like you're a vice president and it makes it much harder to bring the prophetic word to the hand that feeds you you know, what, what hill are you willing to die on? To use a lot of sort of cliche, like how hard are you gonna go pushing for your university to divest from fossil fuels? Um, or to, you know, how, how much will you call your, 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 your work, your, your, your business out for being racist? Cause you might, you might get fired or maybe not fired, but you might not get that promotion or that publication or that thing you're going for. Um, and so you end up becoming bossed and bought, literally bought. So I think the challenge is how does one remain free? This is this transcends black scholars. I think this is true for all kind of like theologians. Oh, thank you, sir. Hey, come say hi. My little mistress came say hi. Hey, <laughs> That's great. That's great. I think one of the challenges is to not become domesticated. You need mm. to stay wild. Um, again, this transcends black scholars. I think this is true um, for religious leaders who kind of, you know, come out of seminary ready to kind of like go to war, but then you kind of want to keep favor with your bishop or like whatever the council here and kind of you want to work your way up or politicians who have all kind of ideas and then 20 years in are kind of voting for crap they don't want to vote for. Yeah. Or, or just all of us, you know, I, I, to ramble one more sentence. I remember at our graduation, there was an alum person who's like, 
All y'all are socialists and anarchists now, but every single one of you will be a Republican by the time you're 50. <laughs> it's like, okay. And I'm just trying to get at like, you're gonna make a little bit of money and you're not gonna wanna kind of give that money up. Mm. And you're gonna kind of want your stuff to be safe and whatever. Um, I, no, no comment about politics or whatever. I've said too much about politics, but not that one is good or bad, but her point was true in this sense, that the temptation is very, very strong mm. to look out for number one rather than look out for others. And I think I'm haunted by that prayer I wrote and by Shirley Chisholm's thing of like, dude, I need to always be a free black man. And I'll end with, with a quote from my friend, Ruth Naomi Floyd. Um, just because it's a, it has Tiffany diamonds on it, it might still be a handcuff. It might still be a chain. It might still be a shackle. So be free. I want to bring one more writing before we, I know we're getting close to our to our time here, but I want to make sure we get in one of your poems. Um, mm. I, I wonder if you have a copy in front of you, um, uh, The Awe and the Awful. Do you have it in front of you at all? You know, I, I, you emailed it to me, so I, I just had it right here. <laughs> Good, because I, I, would, I would love you to read it and to share uh, and to share a little bit about it as we come to a close. Could you do that for us? Sure. The Awe and the Awful. I appreciate you, let me read it. I appreciate you, let me read it. We are the awe and the awful, fearfully and wonderfully made. We, full of dreams and imaginations, with enough love to pray for a world without hunger or poverty or war, and enough faith to hold on and keep loving until we get there, but awful too. Too much killing, awfully selfish, awfully fearful, not wonderful. Humans are complex, they told me. We're all in process, they said. We are the awe and the awful. You know, I, uh, a friend, another mentor who passed this year, it's been a hard year, named James Spady, was a person who, who said that to me, that we're all in process meaning like we can be pretty awful at times, we as a society, but we can be wonderful and awesome and, 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 and awe-inspiring too. And I think I'd wanna you know, give that message to particularly young people who might be listening. Like America feels pretty crappy right now. You know, they're, they're li still, there are kids in cages and there are a ton of people without jobs and a whole lot on the street. And our country is literally on fire right now. And there is a lack of trust and hard to know what to believe truth wise. And there's an uptick in anti Semitism right now. And violence against East and South Asian people is worse than it has been in a long time. And certainly violence against Black bodies. And there are policies around homophobia. And like, it's just it's just a hard time to be in the world and not even talking about the environment and like other stuff. It feels pretty awful. But there's also a lot of beauty out there too. And it might be a friend you meet this year or the fact that a lot of different people are allowed to go to Syracuse now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 80 years ago we weren't. Or the fact that like, look, a lot of people can love each other in ways they couldn't love before. And ultimately, I think the world will be better because of you. It feels awful right now, but we kind of need you to help pull us back toward awesome. And, and I believe, I think we're going to get there. Chaz, I want to thank you for your time. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, I know that our staff has been putting up some links. I do recommend Chaz's writings, his books. Um, you can look him up. And I've enjoyed reading his poetry, his theology. Um, Chaz, you're, you're a gift to pen and beyond. And I'm so grateful for your time. 
Um, I, of course, uh, will be thinking about you a lot in the weeks ahead in case uh, your Sixers end up playing my Milwaukee Bucks. I'll be thinking about you and, and hoping um, for the best for myself. <laughs> and uh, you, you'll, be, you'll be close to my heart. And uh, I'll call you to wish condolences, uh, hopefully. And, uh, but in all, serious, <laughs> in all seriousness, thanks for all that you bring on so many different levels. And to everyone here, thank you so much for joining in. We've really appreciated bringing these conversations to a wider audience across the country, across the world, to the Syracuse University, alumni, students, faculty, staff, uh, wherever you are tonight, we wish you the fullness of health. We wish you the fullness of hope. Uh, thank you. God bless you. Have a great night.